professors for lunch uh, after the school year. Uh, my name is Philip Munoz. I teach in the political science uh, department and at the law school. Uh, and I'm the director of the Tocqueville program, which is sponsoring uh, this afternoon's event. Uh, last semester, a group of students, a group of my students, uh, were in my office and we were just chatting about uh, intellectual life here in Notre Dame. And uh, I went to a small liberal arts college and I asked them, you know, how often do you get together with your your professors, have, you know, have a meal, uh, share some conversation. And they said it didn't really happen that much at Notre Dame, uh, which shocked me, to be honest. Because if I were paying $50,000 a year to come to school, <laughs> I would not have to the professors who were teaching me. And it, it's really a travesty, too, because we have some of the best faculty uh, in, the, in the nation, in the world, here. Uh, so we wanted to create a forum where professors and staff and students could get together have good conversation, share a meal, and learn with one another, learn and talk to one another. And that led to uh, Professors for Lunch. So our third event in the series, which we hope, uh, hope continues on for, uh, for the rest of this year for sure, and hopefully for years to come. Uh, before I introduce uh, Megan to come introduce uh, our speakers, uh, let me thank just a few individuals. Excuse me, we have here. Oh, thank you. Uh, the, the Dean's Office, uh, the Office of Undergraduate uh, Studies, especially Dean uh, Del Neva and <coughs> really have provided uh, tremendous support. They also bought your lunches, so we should thank them. Uh, my assistant, Jennifer Smith, <coughs> I'm going to point her out, she's walking towards the back of the room. She set up everything. So thank you, uh, Jennifer, for all the work. And then three students in particular who uh, really provided the energy and enthusiasm for this event, uh, Lizzie Helpling, uh, Neil, Rabinda, and Megan, Megan Thompson. I really just, they, their enthusiasm to carry this on uh, brought us here today. So thank you, especially to you and all the Dean's fellows. Um, one more announcement. We have two more of these events uh, in the next few weeks. Next Friday, uh, in the North Dining Hall at New York, uh, Carter Sneed of the Law School is going to give an overview of the Department of Health and Human Services contraception mandate explain what the law involves and the religious liberty issues involves. That's next Friday, North Dining Hall, St. And then two weeks after that, that is the Friday of the Michigan game, we're going to have a faculty panel on the same subject. Uh, the title of that panel is Why is Notre Dame Suing the Obama Administration and Should It Be Doing So? Okay, so come join us again next Friday and then uh, three weeks from now for our, our next two events. And thank you.
And this uh, seminar series was known for being a very kind of aggressive environment. If, if you were a speaker and you spoke to that <laughs> seminar, you uh, could expect to hear some of the most devastating challenge kind of harshly worded questions. And so whenever they had the professor, they would often say, we're pleased to have so-and-so for lunch today. And I thought, well, exactly what does that mean? And so we'll find out uh, what professors for lunch really means. But uh, I, I'd like to begin uh, by taking you to uh, northern Uganda in East Africa, where I, where I spent some time. Uh, it was only um, uh, two or three weeks ago. And... Um, this is a place that was uh, convulsed by a war for uh, over 20 years, beginning in the late 1980s. A war between a group called the Lord's Resistance Army and uh, the Ugandan government. Now, the Lord's Resistance Army is a rather bizarre kind of uh, army. It's uh, uh, cult-like. It's led by a leader who believes that he uh, speaks for the Holy Spirit and wants to have a republic governed by the Ten Commandments. Well, I think you should read more carefully, uh, Thou Shalt Not Kill, um, because he's done a lot of that. And um, in, in maybe in a more rational sense, he taps into um, regional animosity against the central government. Um, but anyway, he conducted a war where the people who really believed in the cause were only a handful but they recruited into their army by abductions. They had 20 or 30,000 um, people abducted at, at one time. They would force people into their army, uh, teenage men. They would abduct women to be their, quote, uh, wives. Um, many came out with, uh, with, with children. Um, and, and then forced them to go back into villages and, and uh, commit atrocities. The addition of people recruited into the army um, it, uh, displaced uh, up to two million people who ended up in internally displaced people's uh, camps. And so this is just a little bit about the character of this war. Now in the mid-1990s, there began to arise proposals for how to bring peace to this conflict. And amidst these proposals, you um, saw two very different approaches and philosophies, sharply, sharply different that I think, in fact, represent two different philosophies of peace building that have uh, uh, pervaded the globe and conversations all over the globe about how to bring peace out of war, even dictatorship. Now, the one philosophy um, was rooted in an international institution known as the International Criminal Court. You may have followed uh, the International Criminal Court. It's been up and running since 2002 agreed upon in the Treaty of Rome in 1998. Um, it itself grew out of two uh, ad hoc international tribunals in the 1990s, one for Yugoslavia and one for Rwanda, whose goal was to establish an international court that could actually put on trial individuals who had committed terrible war crimes and crimes against humanity. Of course, the precedent for that was the Nuremberg trials, the Tokyo trials after World War II, which tried the top uh, war leaders. And so it was an attempt to kind of bring that back on an international uh, footing. And it turned out that Uganda turned out to be the site of the first indictments of the International Criminal Court. Uh, five uh, large resistance army leaders were indicted. And uh, with the idea that this would make a major uh, difference in bringing peace to Uganda. However, a very different approach came from uh, an unlikely source, namely religious leaders. Uh, some of the top religious leaders in Uganda, including the Catholic Archbishop, John Baptist Odama, the Anglican bishops, and even the Muslim sheikh from uh, uh, northern Uganda, got together and formed a coalition of religious leaders who advocated for peace in, in a very different way. Um, they devised a whole approach to peace. They even took some brave trips out to the middle of the bush and met with Joseph Kony, the leader of the Lord's Resistance Army, and helped, which helped to pave the way for peace negotiations. But emblematic of their approach was the fact that they were major advocates of the Amnesty Act of 2000 which would give amnesty to anybody who had been fighting in the Lord's Resistance Army with the idea that if you gave them amnesty, you could facilitate reintegration back into their villages. 
The idea was to take this huge army and allow ways for people to get out of it and get back home. Uh, they strongly favored uh, a process of reintegration. And uh, one of the major themes was also forgiveness. Uh, not forgiveness that would occur in isolation, but would also hopefully occur in the context of apologies and reparations and so forth. But nevertheless, forgiveness was a very important uh, uh, concept in their in their uh, portfolio. And uh, so there, there, were some, there were some dramatic examples of people for, who for, forgave members of the Lord's Resistance Army and so forth, but all towards a kind of goal of reintegration and re-knitting the life of the community. And if you think about it, that stands in almost polar opposite to the approach of the um, International Criminal Court. Now, what Uganda has generated is two answers to the question of my book, which is, what is the meaning of justice where massive injustices have taken place? The book finds that it's setting, it's not just Uganda, but in what amounts to one of the most interesting global trends of the past generation, a proliferation of activities and institutions to address injustices that have arisen from war or dictatorship. And this proliferation has arisen in the last generation all over the world with an interest in peace building. The criminal courts and a host of tribunals for trying war criminals are one example. We've also seen over 40 truth commissions, which are bodies designed to find out the truth about the past and bring acknowledgments of victims. Uh, reparation schemes have become much more common. Apologies are proliferating. Everything from, uh, you know, President Clinton was a big apologizer. Everything for, from uh, his dalliances in the White House to U.S. crimes in Guatemala. Uh, or he even apologized to the Rwandans for failing to intervene. But apologies have become much more common in uh, global politics. Forgiveness is now appearing in the past generation in political contexts where it didn't appear much before that. The building of monuments and memorials, and also efforts to build reconciliation at the level of civil society, some of which I've uh, been in myself. Part of my book came out of work that I've done in promoting reconciliation in the region of Kashmir between India and Pakistan, and more recently in Central Africa under the auspices of the Catholic Peace Building Network. So it is in this setting that the question is asked, what is the meaning of justice in the wake of massive injustice? And the dominant answer to this question is what may be called the liberal peace. It's dominant because it prevails in the leading global institutions like the UN and Western governments and so forth. By liberal, I mean it's based on the ideas of the Enlightenment, like individual rights, human rights, and the rule of law. And central judicial prosecution is probably sort of the crowning uh, theme in that approach. And then, so the ICC represents kind of the temple or cathedral of that approach. But an alternative challenger uh, paradigm has also arisen, which has shaped uh, the approach in places like South Africa, Timor-Leste, Guatemala, Chile, Sierra Leone, Uganda, elsewhere, that goes by the name of reconciliation. And the central idea here, if rights is the central idea of the liberal peace, is the central idea here is restoration of relationship. What is envisioned is a holistic res restoration, one that might include human rights. I don't reject that, of course, but it's um, but much wider, aimed at addressing the wide range of wounds that war and dictatorship inflict on people. It addresses these wounds both because it is intrinsically just, but also because doing so helps to build qualities like trust and legitimacy for democratic governments and peace settlements. And thus, people's emotions of hatred and revenge are addressed, peace and democracy are not likely to be sustainable. In this way of thinking about justice, I would argue, comes to us from religious traditions. In the book, I look at Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And I believe that in the scriptures of each of these faiths, restoration of right relationship characterizes the action of God, but is also prescribed for horizontal relationships within human communities. I also explore ways in which it is articulated in secular terms in the restorative justice movement. I believe it also resonates with uh, tribal traditions uh, all around the world, in, in, many, in many places, many uh, settings around the world. Now, reconciliation, in my view, is not some utopian end state where everybody is hugging each other, but rather I have in mind uh, political reconciliation, where people respect one another's rights as citizens. 
But even political reconciliation requires more than rights, law, and prosecuting war criminals. The book outlines six practices that address the range of wounds that political injustices inflict, and each in their own way seek to bring about the restoration of persons and relationships. Briefly, they are, first, the building of socially justice institutions, second, acknowledgments, the work of truth commissions, third, reparations for victims, Fourth, what I call restorative punishment, or forms of accountability that serve to reintegrate people and communities. Fifth, apology. And sixth, forgiveness. Each of these practices has taken place all over the world in scores of countries over the past generation. It's also worth saying that they are always complex, they're partially achieved, far from perfect, hollowed by power, complexity, or just the sheer magnitude of suffering. But they do take place, and stories and accounts from around the world reveal that they yield successes as well. The most controversial of the practices, and perhaps the one that most challenges the liberal peace, is forgiveness. It is the only practice that is not based centrally on rights, or that doesn't involve a rights claim. For no perpetrator has a right to be forgiven by a no um, perpetrator has a right to be forgiven by a victim. It is rather based on the goodwill of the victim as many would say, the grace of God. It has a dramatic, surprising quality, one that interrupts what is expected in terms of deserts and entitlements. And it's actually the practice that I find the most interesting. Today in Uganda, tens of thousands of people who were abducted into the Lord's Resistance Army or lived in camps for displaced people are now reintegrated into their communities. Now when I was there you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was widely told that there's an end to war, but there's not peace here. I was told that there are still land disputes. It's very common when people return from conflicts, someone else lives on their land. And many scores of conflicts that still need to be settled between people. But most were convinced that the solution is practices of reconciliation that can restore relationships. Today, the ICC has neither tried nor convicted um, any of the people that it, it has indicted. Some believe that it's even prolonged war. Finally, um, hopefully there's enough there to uh, get some discussion going. But we might also ask, um, I, I set this very much in a global political context, we can also ask what application this might have for American politics in an age of polarization, or even towards the wounds, some of the wounds in our own past, slavery and the denial of civil rights, perhaps the Vietnam War, or even ongoing controversies like abortion. I also think, uh, looking at this at a Catholic university, that there's an important Catholic dimension to it. I frame it in terms of three religions, seek to give it a secular articulation as well, in order to show how it can be the subject of an overlapping consensus in pluralistic settings. But I also think there's a sense in which reconciliation is, uh, flows out of uh, uh, core commitments in the Catholic faith, particularly the transformation and restoration that we find in the Eucharist. Uh, in Pope Benedict's letter on the Eucharist, Sacramentum Caritatis, uh, towards the end he talks about the social implications of the Eucharist. Now if you've uh, experienced the Eucharist, you probably aren't thinking of societies building socially, social justice as a result of that. But he thinks that the Eucharist has a transforming effect on all of the world, and that if one participates in the grace of the Eucharist, one is thereby committed to the kind of trans reconciling, transforming effect, and to bring that into the social and political realm. So, I think that there's a, uh, that, you know, very much plays into the logic of the book, in the sense in which I'm seeking to root the ethic in religion. Also, all, I believe that religious traditions have something to say about justice and reconciliation that can actually inform a global conversation among both uh, religious and the non-religious. Thank you.
building socially just institutions. Um, on the one hand, yes, this is a, a central commitment of the liberal peace agenda that Dan has uh, been highlighting throughout the book and offering critiques of. Uh, but it can also be a practice of reconciliation. There's a capaciousness in his view. He is creating space for further conversation, further dialogue. Uh, in a climate, as he just noted, that is so polarized. Dan's um, approach of overlapping consensus through rooted reason consistently reflects this method of spaciousness. So, as I was reading through the practices that he's upholding as part of an effort of political reconciliation, um, I read very sympathetically a lot of my own work uh, has been on correlating social sin, systemic sin, with practices of sacramental and extra sacramental reconciliation. Um, and so, in my new background as a theologian, uh, predisposed me to think of the ethic of political reconciliation within a, a broader societal context uh, that would allow for uh, people's uh, moral and ethical departure points in faith traditions to inform that view. Um, when I read the part about reparations as a practice, um, there is a section where Dan takes up distributive justice. And uh, he argues that reparations would not use distributive justice as a guiding rationale, um, but rather uh, they would involve redressing victims of identifiable wrongdoing. So he disagrees with Bob Powell's argument that, uh, if you're at uh, Dan Bodhi Powell, if everyone has suffered, why should only some be redressed? So Dan wants to trace the warrant for reparations to particular wrongful acts. But what happens in a case like South Africa, in which it is really the whole system that is objectively disordered at a moral level? Um, and it isn't really possible to track down all of the discrete wrongful acts that have contributed to the whole systemic disorder. Um, in moral theology, especially with John Paul II's writings, that's what we have come to call social sin. Um, situations of systemic moral disorder in which if you looked for discrete moral agents who contributed to this disorder, you would not be able to account for the fullness of the disorder at stake. Um, in many of the cases that Dan highlights, uh, and he acknowledges, uh, there are root causes of conflict, including economic injustice, deep systemic injustice, um, that would have to be re redressed and addressed at some point as part of a whole process of reconciliation. I'm thinking, for example, and this is an example that, that Dan points out, uh, of the mothers who have been disappeared in Argentina, um, who refused material reparation. They, they didn't want to be bought out. They didn't want to be silenced in that way. But were they just seeking an apology? Or were they looking for something more? Um, I think that they were looking for systemic change and accountability, not, not simply an apology, as part of a larger process of reconciliation. So if we're thinking about this restoratively, and I think that's one of the uh, works of genius in Big Dan's approach, is approaching an ethic of political reconciliation through the lens of three different religious traditions, but also the lens of restorative justice. Um, if we think about justice restoratively, wouldn't distributive justice have a part to play in a longer process? Especially if we want to include the voices and the experience of all of the people who have been harmed in a given situation. And that brings me to a brief second point. Um, in discussing restorative punishment, um, uh, Dan says restorative punishment is the central concept of restorative justice. And when I read that, I thought, oh boy, I hope we get to talk about this. Because thinking about restorative justice, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really begin with the idea of punishment as the central concept, um, but rather to think about this question of the harms that have occurred in a given situation of, of conflict, uh, asking what these are, um, and asking the parties to a harm to identify that. That's how we're going to discover it. And then that leads to the next step. What would it take to restore the balance of relationships? And in some cases, if we're talking about systemic disorder, 
it may well be the case that regulation of truth never existed in the first place. So what does restoration look like? Because in some cases, I think we're going to have to talk about creation of our relationship. Um, so how do we flesh out restorative justice? Um, and what would be the role of, of punishment? That, in fact, is a debate within the field of restorative justice. Um, so I, I, uh, if I had a little more time, I would also want to pursue the section on 221 to 222 about the Sermon on the Mount, um, Matthew 5, 38 to 42. You all know this passage. Um, if they ask you to go one mile, go two. If they ask you for your cloak, give them your undergarment as well. If they strike you on one cheek, turn and offer your other cheek. Um, when I was reading this, uh, I wondered how Dan might respond to Walter Wink's interpretation, in which Wink says these um, three examples uh, represent a, a nonviolent, subversive response to an oppressive system. That in each of these cases, in the political context of, of Jesus' people, uh, these, were, these were practices that served as forms of abuse of the people. And in each case, we argues, uh, for example, turning the cheek, um, one would be striking with the right hand, and, and one has to, in that culture, one had to strike with the back of the hand uh, someone who was subordinate. By turning the other cheek, you're forcing that person, using only the right hand, to use the open palm, which implies equality. And so there is a claiming of dignity. At the same time, it's subversive because it also uh, draws the perpetrator into acknowledging that he or she, in fact, uh, by exercising violence, uh, is diminishing his or her own dignity. So there's an opportunity for both parties to, parties to restore dignity. That's Wink's argument. I just wondered what Dan might have to say about that uh, in the context of oppressive use of, of legal mechanisms. So, thanks very much. Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon. And thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, this is a really important and, and interesting and worthwhile book. And I should read it. It's, it's important both for uh, the substance of the argument it presents, but it's also really important for the method that it uses to get there. And I'll say a few words about that. Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, you could call my comments here uh, three kudos and a challenge. Maybe um, uh, it's, it's not doesn't have quite the, the ring, uh, the entertainment value of four weddings and a funeral. <laughs> and, um, and I don't claim to have the screen presence of Hugh Grant, but I'll be a whole lot shorter than four weddings and a funeral so that we have time for discussion. So just very briefly in a few minutes. Um, I, I read this book, I approach this, these comments as uh, a legal scholar, right? A jurist, a, a practicing lawyer as well, and, and particularly one from the field of human rights. Okay? Um, so viewing this argument, the way it's constructed and the conclusions it reaches, as a jurist of human rights, um, I'd like to point out, I guess, you know, three ways in which I think uh, the argument and the material in the book and the perspective on justice is superior to many conventional approaches to human rights discourse and an ethic of human rights. And one way in which um, I, I want to raise a question, at least, about whether it, it is capable of being as effective as an ethic of human rights. So, so starting with the with the kudos. Um, first of all, uh, we get to the question of method. Uh, as Dan pointed out in his comments, this is an ethic that is constructed out of a pluralism of religious traditions, in particular. Um, and makes a point of arguing that that is appropriate, even in trying to arrive at a universal or a cross-cultural discourse, a discourse that is capable of expressing certain kinds of practices and values of justice, even across <coughs> deep divisions within a culture or across cultures. Right? And uh, that is, in fact, um, a method that is quite contrary to the dominant methods of the way that human rights have been done for 60 or 70 years. In other words, uh, not, not always, uh, but the 
principal way in which you see dialogues about human rights proceeding on a global scale or cross-cultural level is precisely by, on the basis of an assumption that we have to take those most deeply rooted particular kinds of commitments that we have, the comprehensive worldviews in Rawlsian terms, and set them aside. We have to bracket them, because that's the only way that we can arrive at some kind of authentic understanding that we can share across these deep divisions. Phil Potts book challenges that and <clears throat> sets it aside and says, no, it's precisely by being rooted in these you know, deeply held beliefs, thick traditions, and from those arguing out with reasons that are capable of being recognized by others, that we arrive at a much thicker, more substantial, and more likely to be successful kind of ethnic reconciliation. That's really important, and it seems to me to really challenge uh, fundamentally the way that human rights is, is mostly done today. Um, then moving to some of the substance, I didn't say a lot more, I just want to take the time uh, on that. Moving to the substance of, of the conclusions, um, two more things that I think uh, suggest that in certain ways this argument is superior to what we usually see in the human rights sphere um, in, in the substance. One is that you know, the basic uh, sort of implicit premise of a lot of human rights language and, and arguments is that human rights belong to individuals and those individuals exist in binary relationships with other individuals or institutions that owe them obligations and justice. Okay? So justice is a question of right and wrong, right and duty, my rights versus the, particularly the state's obligation towards me, but often other individuals. And that's all good. I mean, that's part of the reason why human rights has been so successful over the decades. We like that, right? It puts in very powerful relief in the language, uh, the dignity of the individual person, the obligations of the state. Uh, and, you know, by focusing on that binary relationship, it helps to highlight that there really are individual claims at stake. It's part of, of, of what, we, what we get out of the language. But something's lost in that, too. Uh, what's lost are the more collective dimensions of justice, the communal dimensions even of human identity and human dignity. We can't always reduce what it means to be a human person possessed of dignity that is respected simply to an analysis or perspective that focuses on the autonomous individual. And this is an argument that really takes seriously that fact. The process is something that can only be understood comprehensively and adequately when viewed from the perspective of the common good of the entire community within which a particular person is, is situated. Um, a, a, a third way in which the superior is, is related to that and has a lot to do with um, a lot sort of very specific recent trends in international human rights law and practice. Um, there's been, in my view at least, a very disturbing trend in human rights in the last 10 years probably or so towards uh, what I regard as an excessive reliance on punishment and punitivism, right? Uh, when there's been a violation of someone else's rights, somebody else has to be punished. Otherwise, we can't possibly conclude that justice has been done and that the wrong will be righted. As the book emphasizes, there's a certain truth, right, to the centrality of punishment and the need for punishment in order to rectify a wrong and an imbalance in that. Uh, but relying solely on punishment uh, really obscures a lot of the other ways in which uh, there, there can be a restoration or a recreation, a, a creation of right relationships. Um, amnesties are, uh, and, and all the law and practice surrounding amnesties after political violence and injustice are a perfect example of this, right? Um, in, you know, the laws of the inter-American system of human rights, the one in which I have worked uh, for years, um, you know, the institutions of the system have never met an amnesty they didn't condemn. I, 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 literally, that's true. Okay. It doesn't matter what the contours of the amnesty are. It doesn't matter whether it was an amnesty that was bilateral or unilateral, whether it was arrived at 
by the very perpetrators of the crimes, or whether it was arrived at through uh, a democratically participatory, participatory process afterwards. It doesn't matter whether it was an amnesty that only covers the grossest crimes against humanity, or whether it covers ordinary crimes as well in the context of the conflict, right? There's no kind of um, careful thought about, uh, gee, about why, in fact, amnesties have been used in every human society for millennia to try to reach the, a resolution, a reconciliation, a harmony in the society. Philip Hospital takes seriously that you have to examine each amnesty on its own terms. Um, that, that, you know, punishment presumptively is necessary, at least for certain people in certain circumstances, but there are, there might be many ways in which amnesties rightly craft, rightly used, accompanied by other forms of, uh, of restoration, reparations, apologies, uh, memory, uh, and so forth, could be a, a, appropriate. Now, here comes the challenge, and it comes from exactly that point. Your book says, we're going to take each amnesty on its own terms, right? We can't generalize about it. And, you know, as a lawyer, that's a problem for me. I mean, we, we arrive at laws that have rules, and rules that are institutionalized, precisely in order to be able to arrive at a practice that is stable, constant, predictable, uh, knowable in advance, um, that provides a certain degree of the protection of equality because they're consistently applied across different situations to, to people. And um, so there are lots of things we gain precisely by making systems of law in which we deliberately, even though artificially, constrain to some extent the scope of moral reasoning, right? In other words, legal arguments are not unrestricted moral arguments. We set some kinds of questions aside and reason on them in constrained ways in order to provide stability to the system. If you say, we're going to argue about every amnesty on its own terms, going to fundamental moral questions in every case in an unrestricted way, can this ethic of just and unjust peace, an ethic of reconciliation, provide the basis for a system of law and an institutionalized system of rules? That's where my big question is. Thank you to uh, all, all three of our speakers. Uh, thank you too for making your remarks uh, in the uh, time frame. So we have uh, time for discussion and questions. I know some of you need to leave, but uh, you have appointments or classes or to get back to work. So uh, please stay if you can, but when you need to, to go, that's uh, fine too, of course. Uh, one request, uh, whenever you leave, if you can bring your trays and uh, garbage out of the room, that will help uh, the dining hall dining staff considerably. Okay. Yeah, should we start with just uh, a minute or two? Should we open it up to the floor? Okay, so um, the, the floor is open for questions. If you might um, tell us who you are and uh, your position here at Notre Dame uh, before, before you ask the question, and then I'll respond so everyone can, I'll, I'll um, repeat the question so everyone can. In students first, we always have a typical program like the invite questions from students first. Please. Mm. Uh, my name is Ali Bhudala from Nepal. For the last two years, I worked in the Open Peace Committee, and especially we worked for social reintegration of the former uh, conflict victims. <coughs> uh, I have a question in terms of trust and social justice about truth and reconciliation commissions. Though it's been almost six years, we have uh, the uh, you know comprehensive peace accord. After that, we we, we have we have you know this process uh, assembly election for four years. That parliament and you know this house work and now this dissolves. And these two commissions, like disappearance commissions and truth and reconciliation commissions, the bill was already passed by the parliament and even the government. I think almost three government. Uh, we we have this is the third. Uh, Second, third, fourth one. The fourth government now we are having after the uh, you know constitutional assembly, assembly ele election. But almost all the government they say that yes we have we have already passed these two bills and we are going to establish two and reconciliation commission. But when the issue comes to implementation, you know CT 
Till now, we have, you know, the government has not established the commission, like, you know, put the constitution and put this happiness. Because both the white factory, uh, one, one party, like the mouse on the one side, and the other hand, you know, the security, especially the military, you know, when this commission established, after that, when the commission started working, the, uh, you know, supreme, uh, uh, for people like the uh, you know generals in milit milit national security mechanism like and the national army and the central leader of Maoist party, I think they will be charged in terms of alleged severe human rights violation. I don't, I you know I think my question is it will be interesting if if I learn uh, this issue about the and conservation commission and this and how this will work, how this is working in Uganda, especially in Uganda, if that will be a lesson for Nepal. Okay, thank you very much. So the question for those who didn't hear it, uh, referred to that uh, if, if we assume that Dan is right in his argument, or that it's an argument worthwhile to pursue, uh, how do you structure incentives for governments actually to implement uh, a process of reconciliation, whether it's through the Reconciliation Commission or other forms of restoring the right relationship? Obviously, there would be some institutional actors that might have an incentive not to start down this process. And yeah, maybe we could come up to the microphone. Yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, truth commissions are one of the most fascinating, kind of innovative things that have happened in global politics, in, in my view, in the last generation. Um, so the idea is after you have a, you've been, you know, the other side of a transition away from a dictatorship or a civil war, that you form a national commission. Formally, it's its task is to try to find out the truth of the human rights violations of a particular period, the civil war, the dictatorship, what have you. But often it does so much more. Uh, probably the most famous truth commission to date is uh, South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And there they had, after the transition away from apartheid, they had a national commission that was televised, got attention all over the world, it went around the country, and listen to the stories and testimony of, of victims. Oftentimes, sometimes the perpetrator was right there in the same room. So you had to, it was drama, it was theater. And, um, you know, many people testified that that had a kind of healing effect if they were a victim, maybe you could have your story told. This was also a case that was based upon amnesty. Professor Carrasso was talking about that. Um, they decided to give a conditional amnesty to people who had committed terrible human rights violations in return for your testimony. So we sacrificed what might be thought of as just punishment, but we got the story, the true story of the past, which arguably would, have, would not have come out in a trial setting. After all, in a trial, you're very strategic. You try to marshal the information to win your case. Well, the truth commission, we just want to let it all come out. And so, then, you know, from, from that, the good thing is South Africa got a national narrative of the truth about the past. It solemnly delegitimized apartheid. It gave acknowledgement to many victims. It, in um, some cases, led to reconciliation, in some cases, forgiveness. But on the other side of the ledger, they didn't get, you know, punishment of some of the worst perpetrators. There was very little in reparations, which there were supposed to be. So any truth commission, we have to kind of evaluate, you know, the strengths and weaknesses. There have been 40 truth commissions in the world. Some have been very strong and effective. Some have been very weak. Now, you mentioned Uganda. They had a truth commission in the late 1980s. Very few people have ever heard of it. Very few Ugandans have ever heard of it. It was one of the weak ones. It didn't get much attention, partly because there was very little political will behind it. So, so you, know, you might ask, well, what are some of the variables that make for a good one, and how do I know if that's going to be in Nepal, right? Well, it's hard to say exactly. I think political will is kind of a big concept, but I think that's one. I think that um, when it's even-handed in terms of the perpetrators that it looks like, it get, that it looks at, it gets them from different sides of the conflict, if it looks like it's just an instrument of one party's or one faction's agenda, it's probably going to be... You know, you, you want something that's going to be seen as a national narrative. I think that um, some of them are very narrow investigatory bodies. Others have hearings where people get to tell their stories. And I think that's the, a feature of a good one as well. 
You also want one that is strong in terms of its staffing, its band-aid, its, um, you know, the scope through which it can look at the past. So if I were uh, a consultant to Nepal, some of those, so that, those would be some of the things that I would say that you need. Reconciliation in this thick sense 
um, a whole set of political practices that seek to overcome and restore the balance of justice after gross injustices is something that's achieved with time as it becomes an experience of life, a reality. Please, sir. Uh, my name is Maurice. I'm a master's business student. I was looking at uh, your book in terms of uh, how can it be related to strategic business And we are looking at the aspect of strategic business from the point that we should be able to engage uh, people, uh, the various parties involved, uh, to engage with the capacity and resources to limit and prevent violence over a long period of time. And so looking at reconciliation as a way uh, of helping victims and women to set a skin for violence other than the party aspect of justice. I was looking at it from the Kenyan case. I don't know if you have been able to look at what is happening in Kenya after the post election violence. And we have also a true justice and justice commission which actually is so questionable, especially that even the people who are elected and even the chairman has been called all the time to really uh, you know, fight to maintain his position. And the public does not want him to be the chairman. So how can we make reconciliation first as a process of healing, gain public confidence so that the people can really agree with what is going on as a way of healing? And secondly, looking at conciliation as a way to build, I'm sure that uh, in the process of um, violence, institutions have to behave alongside conciliation so that this institution, like the court, can as well actually have you know, a way to restrain people from a continuous aspect of violence. And so how can we match the two aspects of um, human rights and conciliation so that Alongside the presentation, we can be able to say, in the long, in the long run, we are not going to live by the rest of the we will be each other. And these people should also fear the rule of law, uh, so that they know when they do some things, at least there's something going on, they can be arrested. Okay, thank you. That's uh, touching on some major things. So, uh, especially in reference mm -hmm. to the situation in Kenya, but we can generalize you know, in any situation. How, how can you help inspire public confidence? given a particular injustice? Um, what about the abuses in the processes of reconciliation? And then I think this gets to Professor Files, not one of Professor Files' comments. What about, um, you need some level of institutional reform to coincide with reconciliation if there is systematic uh, institutional injustice? So yeah, that, that's a very good question. I, I don't know the Kenya case so so much uh, in detail, but one of the one of the points that I was very uh, intentional about making was the importance of uh, socially just institutions like human rights and the rule of law in, as being part of reconciliation, as opposed to something else outside, either left out or balanced against or what have you. So I don't reject the idea of human rights or, or the rule of law, because I see that as being complex forms of right relationship, which is what reconciliation is. And if you think about a rights claim, it's a claim that exists between people and collective, among collectivities of people, but lots of claims that individuals are making peace to one another and their governments. And it involves a you know a specific set of duties and reciprocal um, claims and in uh, between persons. So in a sense, it represents a, a, a rich kind of relationship. And so and I think it's something, something. I think reconciliation becomes cheap reconciliation when that kind of justice is not is not part of it. And uh, I might, in this context, talk a little bit about the the economic of the distributive justice. So in fact, distributive justice is a part of what I want to see happen in reconciliation. Now in the book, I include that in the chapter on building just institutions as opposed to reparations. 
But that more than anything, I think, is just a kind of way of organizing my ideas. Because I think there is some distinction to be made between those you know, economic injustices that happen because somebody did a wrong versus those that um, are the results of a much more impersonal set of you know, maldistribution of wealth, which may in fact probably is a result of wrongs, but it's much harder to to trace the way that you spoke about. But that kind of broader maldistribution I see as part of building socially just institutions and thus as part of part of reconciliation. And uh, so you know tensions do arise here, but I I think as part of a holistic process of reconciliation, distributive justice does have to be included. Uh, I mean, something like South Africa is complex because part of the deep injustice was the structure of, of apartheid. Now there, though, I think you can say, I mean, that was something that was quite intentionally created with a very specific idea in mind at different points in history. Uh, so you have this kind of mixture of the personal and, and the impersonal. Uh, but I think that, you know, central for me is that that has to be part of uh, reconciliation. And if you, uh, the way that this res uh, message resonates is if you look at, uh, during apartheid in South Africa, there was something called the Kairos Movement, which was a movement of, of black theologians. And there was a lot of talk in the anti-apartheid movement about reconciliation, remarkably, kind of like the civil rights movement in the United States with Martin Luther King. Reconciliation was part of the message of the opposition movement that, you know, when this is all well and done, we envision a reconciled, unified society, which is something that's very something attractive and appealing about that. It's unlike, the, say, the kind of military movement that just wants to defeat and get rid of the uh, uh, opponent. But these theologians felt that the talk of reconciliation was too strong and that the talk of justice was not strong enough. And they wanted to strongly make the point that, uh, you know, there has got, reconciliation has to mean an end to an apartheid. And uh, they didn't dispense with the idea of reconciliation, but they felt like the other black theologians who were talking about reconciliation weren't strongly enough, strongly oppositional enough. And so, uh, you know, and that's, you know, exactly who was right there, you know, we can debate. But I think that, you know, that's sort of a good example of a group that made the point about reconciliation, including a commitment to just institutions, economically, legally, and, and so forth. Mr. Paul, do you want to add anything to that? Way in the back. Uh, uh, speak loudly so we can hear you. Yes, uh, I'm sharing this on uh, Expanded to a whole set of practices for an entire nation 
and has been through um, a period of injustice. Um, so, but, but what about what is restorative punishments, and why? Why does that sound might, might sound kind of oxymoronic? Well, I wanted to very much keep uh, punishments, or some might refer accountability, as part of uh, the reconciliation model, because I think that one of the wounds that arises out of a crime is what I call the standing victory of injustice. The sense in which the perpetrator has done a harm to the moral order, and unless there's something that is sort of brings that down, the perpetrator sort of stands victorious in that in that part. That there's no, uh, I mean, this is the part that in some sense that retributivism has it right that there ought to be some countervailing uh, message or action that sort of uh, nullifies that deed and says no, that harm in the moral order is one that you know cannot stand. I think maybe this is what uh, you know in Chile. Long after uh, the, the dictator Pinochet had left power, there were groups who still wanted him to be on trial. Even after he became an old man and was sick and, and, you know, completely defanged and so forth. But I think, you know, why, why did, was, was that some kind of, like, thirst for revenge? No, I actually think what they wanted was sort of a delegitimation of his message and of his deeds that they felt like they had never gotten. And they felt like the criminal court system was a way of kind of issuing that delegitimation or counter message. And so I think there is a, a, a kind of restoration of right relationships does should involve that kind of counter message that defeats the standing message that the perpetrator has left through his um, through his deeds. However, where I differ from the kind of straight judicial model is that I think that punishment should be done in a way that's long restored restorative justice model that serves to reintegrate communities. And two examples of this are uh, the Gachacha Courts in Rwanda and uh, community uh, reconciliation forums in uh, Timor-Leste. And, and also, well, I guess I would say that those two maybe. And what they did was they took uh, a certain class of people who had done a certain class of crimes generally not the top leading perpetrators. And they said, rather than put them on trial in a kind of Western-style court, let's bring the community together. And let's have victims talk about what that did to harm them. Let's have the perpetrator tell his or her story. Maybe we'll find that that was more complex. And, and then we're going to have a, a kind of tribunal of community elders who are going to decide what the punishment should be but usually the punishment takes the form of something reintegrative, like community service or rebuilding homes or something that, you know, goes back into rebuilding the community. And like I say, uh, I, I don't think that kind of form should be used for, say, the top, you know, Slobodan and Milosevic style people, people that the top architects of atrocity, so to speak. But in a you know civil war where there's been widespread participation, the, the numbers of people who have done these you know quote lower level crimes are, are quite uh, numerous, and so this kind of reintegrated sort of accountability is one that I think can um, you know fit into the reconciliation idea. Okay, one one more question. Or get justice for their people. 
I mean, like two years ago, the English government paid uh, reparations to the families who lost, you know, who lost uh, their family members during Bloody Sunday. But that was seen as a symbolic movement. And many people, symbolic does go a long way, but it didn't really change how they felt. And my question is, like, I understand that you don't think about it was forgiveness and reconciliation, but you're not thinking that there's, like, more to it, like, that whole, like, identity that has to be, you know, adapted and changed, and how do you think that it's best to come, you know, no grassroots movement, maybe, or just, you know, or, or do you think that simply having a kind of trial is the best way of doing that? So, yeah, for an identity problem with reconciliation. Great. In reference to Northern Ireland, the dimensions of inter intergenerational <coughs> reconciliation. So even if at one time and place reconciliation takes place, but what about the next generations that might still have memories or a history or still experience some uh, effects of injustice? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think one, one thing I would say is uh, we are point also reflected, Paolo has pointed about reconciliation and, and changes in identities have they become a lived experience among the population. They almost have to come to think of themselves in a new way, and sometimes that takes a generation to, uh, for that to happen. I think there are certain kinds of measures taken by governments or by uh, leaders of factions and groups that can uh, contribute to that transformation in important ways. One of the points I would make uh, is about the interdependence of practices like reparations, apology, forgiveness, and so forth. Uh, take reparations and apology. Oftentimes, one without the other fails alone and begs what the other has to offer. An, an instance would be um, in Germany in the 1990s. By the way, Germany is a case where massive reparations have been paid uh, over the you know decades following the Holocaust. And, uh, and uh, but the, uh, new, new kinds of episodes are always arising, but there was one where there was uh, victims of slave labor and forced labor during the Holocaust, during the 1990s, were pressing for, uh, there was a, a kind of a movement for reparations for them. And uh, as the negotiations went on, they, uh, you know, were going pretty well, they were going to give them reparations. But uh, the victims themselves objected to that, saying, well, we don't want just to be paid off. So like your example of the Bloody Sunday. We don't want just to be paid off. Uh, uh, we need something more. And finally, what made the, uh, uh, the agreement go through was that the German government also agreed to issue an apology and to represent their story in school textbooks. So students would learn about it. And so it's very important that you know, the, the financial transfer, like you said in the Bloody Sunday, wasn't enough. The kind of message and symbolism that went with it was, was very important. And, um, you know, the kind of message that was uh, conveyed. It sort of saw... On the other hand, sometimes uh, apologies alone might be uh, rejected by victims as being just empty words. You know, we want some kind of material help for our condition. And so again, uh, they, they can go together. Uh, you know, moreover, for forgiveness is something that happens uh, more often after there's been an apology made. Because victims are sometimes more ready to forgive when there's been a kind of acknowledgement or apology. One of the remarkable things I've found um, around the world is that um, victims are often ready to drop a demand for punishment when there has been a kind of delegitimation or apology of what the perpetrator has done. So what makes them most wanting the kind of punitive response is the sense that that injustice has not been brought down, hasn't been delegitimized, de no one has you know, acknowledged properly what has happened. And so, uh, you know, I think that kind of, uh, there are measures that can facilitate the generational change and, you know, they work together and often uh, complement one another. I have, I have one more question here. What about the future community and future group managing so that the next generation will understand that we are now we are we are we are, we are you know I don't know new relationship. Like intercommunity marriage. Intercommunal marriages? Yeah. Ah yes. <laughs> Maybe the ultimate form of uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well I'd love you to think uh
as I as a file, and uh, my good friend Nan Kofi. Uh, this is uh, we've been doing uh, various events uh, for two years. Dan is here twice because uh, he's published two books uh, in the last two years. So Dan will be part of the next book next year. <laughs> uh, so please join me in making our professor. Thank you.